Shalom and greetings friends. Rather than just teach you and emphasize just one old covenant, what I've been teaching in this series on the old covenants is that there's many old covenants, there's a few of them, and most of which have not been made obsolete, which have not been made abolished, which have not been be made a curse if you try to keep our Creator's commandments that are within them. And so if, if you want to worship the one true, the one true Yah of Abraham, then we need to understand these old covenants accurately and also look at the fruits of them today and how they are still valid, they are still ongoing. And so in, in part one of this video teaching, I gave you five, five bullet points. You know, if we want to know for certain which one of these old covenants or any of them, if any of them are still valid today, if they're in full effect, still going forward, and included even within the new covenant, then we need to understand these five bullet points, match them up, put them to the test all five of them with these covenants. Again, in quick review here, we have the Noah covenant. And so, uh, before I get into the, the covenants, actually, the five bullet points I want to mention is point number one, we need to know who is making the covenant. Is it the Creator, a one-sided promise and covenant to a people, or to humanity, or to who? Or is it a covenant that is made between the Creator and a people? And, or thirdly, is it uh, people making covenants to each other? And so, that's point number one, is we need to know who is making the covenant, if it's still going to be valid today, if we're going to evaluate this and put it to the test. Point number two is, uh, what are the conditions of the covenant? Are there conditions? placed on the covenant. If not, then there is no requirement for obedience, as I've mentioned in some of these old covenants, then we need to look at those covenants carefully. And, and then also we need to also look, point number three is, has anyone broke or been unfaithful to that covenant? If a covenant's been broken, then obviously there's unfaithfulness. And uh, especially if it's ongoing and continual unfaithfulness, and it's been, as we call even a divorce, then that's a broken covenant. And even the Creator divorced the ten tribes of Israel. We see that in Jeremiah chapter 3 and in verse 10. So, uh, you know, has it been broken? Is there unfaithfulness to it? Now, if it's our Creator making it only, then we know that He is faithful. He will not break his promises. In fact, even with his covenants, he says that he will not give up on his covenants even when we are unfaithful. And he will even improve them. And so point number four, what are the key words to each of these covenants? And so are there words like eternal or everlasting or perpetual? And are, is there obedience? In, look for that in, as key words, you know, which also apply the conditions of the covenant, of course, the time duration, and so forth. Now, point number five is what are the fruits? Are they still alive today? Do we still see the fruits of them alive today? And so, in the Noah covenant, we see that it's a promise to humanity about a flood never happening again over the whole earth and wiping out humanity and all the animals as it was in Noah's day. We see the Abrahamic covenant. We went through that. So if you want to go back and look at those yourself, it's, it's Genesis 9, chapters 11 through 17. That's the Noah covenant and also the rainbow being a sign. The Abrahamic covenant you can see in Genesis 12, Genesis 15 and 17, and look at the context of those. There's the circumcision covenant that's part of the, the, the Abrahamic covenant, and that is a sign. And so I, I covered those. We went through the five points on those. What are the conditions? 
Is there obedience required for those blessings and those birthrights to be fulfilled? And so we can see that uh, the Noah covenant uh, and even the Israeli covenant, the Sinai covenant as we call it, we can look at the conditions, who it was made with, and there is definitely obedience required in that. And also with Ishmael. And uh, Ishmael was promised to be a great nation and to have 12 princes. And although Ishmael was told that the greater birthright promise was going to be with Isaac, because that was the son of Abraham's wife in wedlock under the marriage covenant. So the greater nation would be Israel. Isaac and his son, his name is Jacob. Remember Esau was the actual firstborn, and so Esau, even being a firstborn, those of you who are descendants of Esau, also need to remain humble and realize that, well, yes, the greater birthright promise was passed on to Jacob. His name was changed to Israel. Israel simply means in Hebrew that you are a conqueror. You are a prevailer with the Almighty Creator and with humanity. And so you, descendants of Ishmael and Esau, and even the Gentiles, need to be humbled and realize we even want to be grafted in. And we looked at the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 10. It says that the kingdom of Israel will stand forever. And it's also in parallel with the kingdom of our Creator. You cannot enter the kingdom of, cre of our Creator Almighty without the kingdom of Israel. They're both one and the same. The Messiah would be born through the lineage of David, and he was a Jew. He'll be the leader of, of King David even. And David will be over the twelve apostles that the Messiah had chosen under his father's direction. And they will be over the twelve tribes. And so we can be grafted in as Gentiles, as Esauites, as Ishmaelites. We can become Israel. And that's what Romans 11 is really, really talking about as wild branches, us being grafted in. It's not a replacement theology. See, even Ishmael, Esau, and the Greeks want to replace Israel. Just because Israel was rebellious... We got to remember the Davidic covenant, you know, which is ongoing, which is mercy. Was as I pointed out in part one, mercy and grace is part of the Davidic covenant, it's included, I should say, and also into the new covenant, the Brit Hadashah, as we read about in Jeremiah. So, the 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 new covenant in Jeremiah 31 talks about His laws. There's the conditions. He will put it in our hearts and in our minds. Now, the Greek theology of Christianity will tell you, oh, you're under a curse if you try to keep our Creator's commandments. They'll try to tell you it's Jewish to try to keep our Creator's commandments, especially ones that predated the Jewish people by over 2,000 years. All Ten Commandments predated. They're not Jewish commandments. They are our Creator's commandments, and the Jewish people has preserved them for us. We should thank them for that. And even the Apostle Shaul says in Romans 3.1, What advantage have the Jews? Much. In every way. They have the circumcision covenant and the oracles, the holy writings. They are not a curse to be keeping those. They're at, they bring more blessings. They don't guarantee salvation alone. You know, obedience is not earning salvation, and, and so we understand that in the New Covenant Scriptures, but it doesn't say that the commandments are a curse. It's, it's the breaking of the commandments. It's our sins that bring penalties. And so when we're under the law only, we're under the penalties also of the laws. And so we want to be under grace, which means we can be forgiven when we repent as we overcome sin and become slaves of righteousness and not slaves of sin and death. And so we need to understand these correctly if we want eternal salvation. And where we fall short, we make mistakes, there is grace and mercy. He's patient with us. He's working with us. And 
the new covenant needs to be understood properly and correctly. And how it applies, how these covenants intertwine with each other. The Davidic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, and even the, the circumcision covenant. Some of them are for physical blessings. DNA promise blessings of the descendants. And you could be grafted in, even if you're not a DNA descendant of Abraham, there's a sign that you can be grafted in, you know, for physical blessings in a human lifespan. We see these blessings of the Abrahamic covenant today. If we look at the greatest of blessings today, as I pointed out in the previous videos. So, if we are misunderstanding these, then we might find ourselves quite disappointed and very ashamed in the future. If we've been deceived, if we've been led astray by our teachers, our pastors, uh, those who we consider our leaders today, if they are going to teach us inaccurately and we just gullibly, naively believe these things, then we will most likely be deceived. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it, it even says, For those who do not love the truth, He, the Almighty, will send a strong delusion that you might believe the lie. And uh, I think that's either 1st or 2nd Thessalonians chapter 2. So, as our Messiah, he, as He even said in Matthew chapter 24 verse 5, He says, For many will come, in my name, saying that I am the Messiah. There's a lot of people out there saying that He is the Messiah. And they will deceive many. So many people are going to deceive, not just a few, not just a, a little bit, but the implication is the majority. Even as we go to Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, it says, Enter by the narrow gate. He says, For wide is the gate, and broad is the way to destruction. People want to create megachurches. They want to make business out of church, out of religion, for money, for gain, to feed their bellies, or just to have more glory and attention you know, to themselves. I don't know all the motives, but he does. But the narrow gate is the gate that, he says, difficult is the way which leads to life. Of course, eternal life. And there are few who find it. Now, that's quite different from what you hear from the majority of Christianity. They want to say, just believe. And, and if you try to keep our Creator's commandments of love, how to love Him first, the first four of the ten tell you how to love Him, the next six show us how to love each other. And even all the law and the prophets, Messiah said, hang on the two commandments. So they shouldn't bring us a curse. When we break them, they bring us curses. So also, jumping forward in Matthew chapter 7 here, our Messiah says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, Master, Master, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. He says, many, not just a few, but he says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons and spirits in your name? Have we not healed and done all these wonders and miracles. There are people out there doing these things in His name. Then, our Messiah says, He says, I will declare to you, to them, I never knew you. You who practice lawlessness. Or we could say Torahlessness, if we look at the word there. He says he doesn't know us if we practice lawlessness. That's quite different from what you hear from 
Protestant theology it says obedience has nothing to do with salvation. They say nothing. You know, Martin Luther's doctrine of salvation by faith alone has nothing to do with works. Now, of course, the other side of the ditch is we try to earn our salvation through works and through obedience. We can't earn it. We need grace. We need mercy. But also realize that our Messiah says that those who teach the least of the commandments will be called great in the kingdom. And those who don't teach them and don't do them, well, they, doesn't even actually say they'll be there, but they will be called the least. And our righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were not keeping the written law very well. He called them hypocrites. They were teaching the law, but they weren't obeying and walking as they should. They didn't have their hearts circumcised and the laws written in their hearts. Then Brit Hadashah, the new covenant, had not come yet. Now it has. We have that helper to overcome to strive for perfection, to be ye perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. Be ye holy as our Father in heaven is holy. And this Father, this Creator, is the same one of Abraham. In the he Abraham was a Hebrew. He, did, he wasn't Aramaic. He didn't... Aramaic is a offshoot from Hebrew, okay? In his whole, the Creator's name in Hebrew, the, the, the word yud Hey vav Hey is the vowels. But uh, how it's pronounced exactly, there's different Hebrew dialects. Some say Yahweh, and others say, well, there's no W in the ancient Hebrew. And so it's Yehovah, it's more of a V. yud Hey vav Hey. It's not Allah. It's not any of these... Jesus or Jesus or Greek names that people come up with. You know, people can use titles. Okay, I'm, I'm not the judge. He is the judge. But I can tell you, there, all of us who have believed in other deities, we need to come to the true name, the holy name, the same name that Abraham obeyed and walked with. Whether we're an Ishmaelite, whether we're an Esauite, whether we're an Israelite, all of us, have, all our ancestors have gone into idolatry and we've accepted other gods with a small g. And we all need to eat humble pie and realize that we all have the same heritage if we come into the Mashiach and accept the same Messiah and, and be grafted in. He is the vine and that vine we read about also is Israel. Yes, he is a Jewish Messiah. All his twelve apostles were Jewish. The writers of the whole New Testament were Jewish. Luke was probably a half-Jew. He doesn't have a Hebrew name. But if you look at the Hebrew names of Matthew, it's Matiyahu, Yochanan for John. They were all Jewish. And the Gospel is going to the Jews first and because of the Davidic Covenant. The kingdom of Israel will endure forever. So when you stand before that Messiah, will he say to you, I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness.